signified, uh, understood by the, the uh, picture of the Son of Man. I think it's, of course, both. Certainly, this is a, a, a title that Lord Jesus applied to himself, one of his favorite self-designations, whereas others don't use it that much uh, uh, for him, but he uses it for himself. And the, the uh, lines of, of connection, I would say, uh, that we've just spoken about the, from this Son of Man to the Son of Man of Psalm 8 and of Genesis 1, uh, I think bring out the, the fact that the Son of Man has in view the, the humanity of uh, uh, our, our Lord and uh, the, the way in which uh, this sort of thing is also developed in the, the book of Hebrews in chapter 2, verses uh, 5 through 9. And, and uh, the... the uh, uh, the two Adam's uh, representations in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, would also bring out the, the, the fact that the Son of Man is pointing to the humanity uh, of, of uh, Jesus. But on the other hand, the deity is clearly there. We just said he comes invested with the glory spirit. Huh? And he comes with the insignia uh, of, of deity. And there are those uh, passages in uh, the New Testament, for example, that, that echo uh, the, the, this picture of the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven uh, the, in the opening chapter of the book of Revelation in uh, chapter 1 verse 13 and in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation chapter uh, 14 verse 14 um, and, and in these passages though the one who is the Son of Man is, is clearly a, a, a d divine uh, being so it isn't either or it's both and uh, that the Son of Man depending on which evidence you are tracking down uh, is a figure you see who uh, uh, is both human and divine. Now, modern critical scholarship will, will argue that Baranash, uh, the, the Aramaic uh, son of man, simply means uh, a human being. And that's fine, that is true. Uh, and, but uh, that doesn't settle the question because certainly in Jesus' usage, when, when he uh, takes this Baranash, son of man title, and applies it to himself, He's not just thinking of, of, of that as uh, whatever meaning it might have in some other uh, context. He is clearly using it in terms of, of uh, its literary appearance here in the Bible, in the canonical scriptures in Daniel 7. So when Jesus calls himself son of man, it's not just a term in the abstract that he's using. He's using that term as it is used here in, in Daniel 7. And as it's used in Daniel 7, yeah, it ties him in with humanity, but it also certainly ties him in with uh, uh, with uh, the deity. So uh, you, you know, on, on that subject, uh, it's it's at both ends. The the other question then of the individual and corporate uh, meanings, and uh, certainly it, the individual one is there. It was Jesus' designation for himself as an individual. That that is true, and uh, yet there are these other indications uh, here that uh, compel us once again to see uh, that there is a, a corporate aspect uh, to, uh, to this and uh, most especially if you look down toward the end of, uh, of Daniel 7 when, when the uh, interpreting angel is expounding all, all of this uh, he says the court will sit and uh, the power of the beast will be taken away and completely destroyed forever All right, decreation and then Okay, and then, uh, when there is no more world power left, notice, then the sovereignty power and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the holy ones, to the, to the saints. So what had been said back in uh, verse uh, uh, 14, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power, and so on. And that is now said of, of, of the whole company of those uh, uh, whom he represented, the saints. After the deep creation, then comes the recreation, and the recreation is one that, that features the saints as those who receive the sovereignty, power, and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven. And this will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. So you can't avoid it. The angel here interprets uh, this son of man Im imagery and, and uh, the authority and so on that he receives as, as including uh, the saints. Now that shouldn't bother us because uh, uh, the Lord himself elsewhere uh, uh, says similar things. Uh, the messianic language of, uh, of uh, breaking the enemy in pieces like a potter's vessel in the book of Revelation is, is, is spoken of uh, the people of God as a whole. Hmm? 
and um, you will sit upon thrones with me, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and so on. Uh, the, the idea of God's people sharing with him uh, on this throne, even uh, Luke uh, 22 uh, there, even as the Father covenanted, covenanted unto me a, a kingdom, so I covenant unto you to, you know, to sit with me in my authoritative uh, reign and to rule and, and to enjoy the royal uh, kingdom with me. So the, the, it, it's, it's the beautiful mystery of our sharing in, in the inherent. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are joined heirs uh, with him of, of his uh, dominion over the cosmos, which fulfills the, the original uh, hope set before Adam uh, to, to be the one that should have dominion over all the works of God's hands, which he, he might have realized apart from the fall, but now it is realized uh, by uh, the, the, uh, the Son of Man and, and all of those whom uh, he, he represents. Well, uh, that may suffice to make the, the main points I wanted to make here in, in Daniel 7 and uh, especially to uh, reestablish the point that kingdom doesn't come in glory until the end of the, the world power and the end of the world power is something that marks the end of the stage of the little horn and is characterized by the great white throne judgment and there's no room, as we've said, for premillennial uh, interpretation of, of things in, within that particular uh, scheme of Daniel 7. Now what we want to move to next, uh, I better get started on it uh, today since we have only one more session next week and I want to be able to uh, do something uh, further here, but we better get started now on on, on another way of uh, approaching this whole question of, of millennialism, and I, I hinted at it. It's the question of, of the crisis, huh? So we've emphasized the theme of the relationship of the kingdom coming in glory to the end of the world. All right, that's fine. That does away with premillennialism. Uh, but now something else that does away with premillennialism is uh, the, on, on their scheme, of course, You know, premiums would agree pretty much with our interpretation of the little horn and the antichrist, <coughs> and they would agree that it's, that is the parousia event uh, then that is uh, being described here. And uh, so there's agreement up to this point, uh, but uh, somehow they they are not ready to do justice to the the fact that 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 judgment is the elimination of uh, the world power uh, and uh, because the millennium according to them follows rather than precedes uh, this uh, parousia and this dealing uh, with the, the antichrist the little horn figure so they have thousand years coming up and there's no getting around it <clears throat> if you're dealing with revelation 20 a thousand years a thousand years ends in a crisis it ends in the gog magog crisis so this is crisis number one for them, and this is crisis number two, but it's a case of double vision. Uh, there's only one crisis, and, and they end up seeing it as, as two separate uh, ones. And, uh, and uh, so the, the actual ultimate decreation for them really takes uh, place here. But meanwhile, during the millennium, they've already had the kingdom come in glory. Now, the end of Gog and Magog crisis will be the consummation, huh, in the great white throne. Uh, but they're, they're separating uh, uh, things. See, even before that consummation, the kingdom has come in glory. Now it comes in glory uh, again, but uh, the, that uh, it confuses things. The, the biblical picture is no coming in glory before the ultimate decreation of things. But this is their scheme, and so to attack it, one has to show that these are not two separate crises, but you have to establish the thesis that Antichrist equals Gog. That Gog may Gog is this. Now, this particular Antichrist episode, it's uh, described in, we, we've been looking at Daniel 7, 
But in the book of Revelation, where once again all of this is expounded, we encounter the, the theme of the battle of the great day of the Lord God all, all, Almighty. And uh, we keep seeing this. And, and by the way, the uh, language of Armageddon, huh? Pre, pre mills would uh, identify this crisis here before the parousia as the, the battle of Ar Ar Armageddon. And so another way of, of posing the, uh, our, our thesis is uh, that uh, Antichrist, uh, our art of God, equals uh, Armageddon. Now, um, as I began to say, the, the book of Revelation then repeatedly speaks about the battle of Armageddon. It actually uses that term only once in Revelation 16, verse 16, where it has just spoken about how the Satan and the first beast and the second beast uh, all emerge and, and, and uh, frog-like uh, demons issue from them that go forth to gather the whole world and deceiving all of the, the peoples and gathering them all together to the day of the, the battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. So Revelation 16 speaks about that. Revelation 17 develops uh, the, the, that thought of the, the battle, the, this final battle, this final judgment on the world power. Revelation 19 uh, of course does that. In Revelation 19 you get the uh, Christ, the, the rider of the white horse, emerges as the warrior from heaven, uh, and with all of the armies of heaven and white priestly robes, uh, you know, conducting this holy war there of decreation of the, or cleansing the temple. And uh, so Revelation 19 has it, and they go forth, and, and all the world is gathered there with its military forces and its generals and all, all this, and, and destruction goes forth, and the, the beast and the false prophet and all their horse uh, are destroyed. So, and in other spots and along the line, in the book of Revelation, as it repeatedly keeps bringing us up to the end of history, it keeps bringing us up to the reference to this great battle of the day of the Lord. And there's only one. It is the judgment day. It is the great uh, ultimate uh, Armageddon battle. And uh, what we want to demonstrate then is uh, that uh, this Armageddon battle, <coughs> which everywhere in the book of Revelation marks the end of, uh, of uh, the world the end, and the end of history is to be equated <coughs> with uh, the Gog Magog episode. The Ezekiel 38 and 39, Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is where we have the full-blown uh, presentation of the Gog Magog crisis. That is the, that is the, the, the source and, and background not just for the uh, Revelation 20 Gog Magog episode, which uh, ends the millennium, but obviously is for that, because in Revelation 20 it speaks about Gog and Magog and so on. So uh, everyone uh, should be readily able to identify Ezekiel 38, 39 with that. But what hasn't been sufficiently recognized or recognized at all is that Ezekiel 38 and 39. Is, is the one that provides the descriptive details and the very name, as a matter of fact, uh, for uh, the Battle of Arm Armageddon, which means then that that battle and that battle are the same one. They're the rooted alike in Ezekiel 38 and 39. They can't be separated. And uh, what we have to do then is to eliminate this whole development. It doesn't fit Daniel 7. It doesn't fit the Bible at all. <laughs> Parousia, preceded by Antichrist, is Gog. Gog, as everyone acknowledges, is uh, something that follows the millennium. The millennium, therefore, is uh, the age that is the same as that represented by the little horn of, of Daniel 7. So that's our thesis now, to try to show that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the to be identified with the Antichrist, uh, uh, with the Armageddon episode. And to do that, uh, to prove that Armageddon is the end of the millennium, not uh, Armageddon is the end of the millennium. Uh, to demonstrate that is to uh, to demonstrate that the end of premillennialism, and uh, I think that that's just precisely what it is. And there really shouldn't be any millennial debate. The evidence is clear and decisive, 
and premillennialism is, is simply not acceptable in any form, classical or dispensationalism. It flies in the face of the basic biblical uh, patterns. Uh, so as I say, that Armageddon is the end of the millennium, is, uh, marks the end of premillennialism as an as a exegetical theory. Uh, that's at least the, the, the high-flown rhetoric that I used to <laughs> introduce <laughs> uh, our treatment of this subject. Now, here you're all familiar, I, I hope, with uh, my article on, uh, on this subject which appeared in the uh, where did it appear? In the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society. Under the under that title, huh? That was the title of the Armageddon, the end of the millennium. But what we want to do to be able to uh, get into this whole discussion is we want to do a, a little closer exegesis of the root passage. Huh? Ezekiel 38 and 39, very critical key thing there. And uh, so we want to get our Hebrew Bibles out again here now and uh, do a little reading through Ezekiel 38 and 39. And as we do so, we'll be wanting to uh, uh, find those features of Gog and Magog uh, that uh, identify it uh, with uh, the Antichrist. Huh? So that Gog, the leader of this whole enterprise, is described in, in Antichrist-like uh, language, his aspirations, his whole career, uh, uh, and so on. He is clearly the, uh, the Antichrist uh, uh, of the So we turn to Ezekiel. I don't know, we haven't we've read a passage or two, I guess, in Ezekiel uh, this term when we were reading uh, <coughs> passages on the New Covenant, uh, but uh, not much beyond that. Well, uh, We're going to be looking at 38 and 39, of course, and uh, Ezekiel's ministry was uh, divided in, in two uh, by the, the fall of Jerusalem, and uh, he's apparently already in exile uh, before the, uh, the city has fallen, and uh, the first part of Ezekiel's ministry is devoted then to uh, warning of what was coming, uh, that the... the, the, the Jerusalem would fall and, and all, all the people would carry uh, exile. And then it finally happens. And then once it happens, he, uh, Ezekiel enters a new phase of his ministry. And now uh, you know, his, his task hitherto had been difficult enough to try to convince the people that, they, they, uh, that the worst was still to come. And now that it has come, now, now he has the difficult task of trying to uh, uphold uh, them uh, that uh, that there's there still is a a, a future and, and so the rest of his uh, book is is devoted to that in particular that's uh, in chapters 34 through uh, 48 and uh, you might just note the structure of those <coughs> Sort of a matchup in the treatment of things. Uh, where chapter 34 and 37 are, are seen uh, to uh, deal with the same themes. In chapter 34, read through that, he's dealing with the, the Messiah, the Messianic Shepherd. You get the language of David as a figure for the Messiah. Uh, the, the Messianic reign of David is uh, one as a reign of, of uh, marked by the covenant of peace and so on. In uh, chapter 37, uh, then later on, he's, he's going through the same sequence again, and he uh, once again <coughs> speaks of the, the people un, under, uh, under the, their shepherd David and the, the thought of his reign of peace, the covenant of peace and so on. It uses the, the resurrection the imagery of the reunion of the, the people and so on. Well, then chapter 35, is the judgment on Edom. So here is God's kingdom, kingdom established of peace and so on. And uh, then there's the, the judgment on Edom as representative of the world powers. And it's uh, that which uh, our passage then corresponds to, what was, what was particularized in the form of the nation of Edom in, in verse 34 is now sort of universalized in terms of 
Gog, Magog, and, and the whole circle of world-encompassing nations uh, described as composing his army. And uh, so it's the judgment, once again, judgment on the world power. And uh, then in each case, you proceed from sort of the, uh, you know, that's the slaying of the dragon, you might say, huh? You proceed from the slaying of the dragon to the establishment of, of uh, the house, the temple, the, the, the throne of the dragon slayer. And uh, so chapter 36 <coughs> is a description of uh, the theocratic land. Mm -hmm. Here, here's the kingdom that's established. It's the new heavens and the new earth. It's like Eden re restored and so on. And then likewise, on a much expanded scale, there's that whole closing section of, of Ezekiel's prophecy uh, where again, it's a, it's a portrayal of the, the eternal kingdom that, uh, in prophetic idiom described as, as the ideal uh, paradise land of the past and once again with reference to, to Eden. So that's rather clearly the structure and he goes through themes and then he does them again. And it's in this context of the, 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 the final slaying of the dragon then that uh, we uh, uh, have our passage about God and, and Magog. Now, uh, as we uh, read through this <coughs> chapter, the hermeneutical basic exegetical question comes up, you know, as, as to what victory over the world power really is in view here. And some of the same options that we uh, found earlier, where, where some would uh, say all this had to do with the second century BC and the Tychus Epiphanes and the Maccabees. Uh, and others would say, no, here, here is a, a final eschatological development that we are, are dealing with. Uh, interestingly, in, in the case of Ezekiel 38 and 39, we have an, at least an outstanding uh, conservative, the Dutch scholar Alders, uh, took the position that what is being described here is precisely the Maccabean victories of the second century BC. And... Uh, he, he felt that some of the details of the description of the battle and what's taking place east of the sea, et cetera, et cetera, were, were so strikingly similar to certain uh, the battles that took place uh, there under the Maccabees that he feels compelled uh, to identify this with that particular historical episode. Uh, his <coughs> son, his son then, uh, Alder's son, also uh, dealt with this subject in his uh, doctoral dissertation and uh, uh, he, he agreed uh, with Papa enough to, to say that, that what happened in the, the second century BC was a first fulfillment of it, uh, but the son at least was alert enough to the implications of the use of this passage uh, elsewhere in the, in the Bible and so on uh, to insist that, that the ultimate fulfillment uh, uh, was down at the, the end, end of history. Uh, I would say that uh, he should uh, eliminate the reference to the second century BC as even a preliminary one. And my understanding would, would be that that uh, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 is referring exclusively and totally uh, to the end of history. That there really is nothing that, that so strikingly resembles the developments in the second century BC that we need feel obliged to find some uh, initial preliminary uh, fulfillment uh, uh, there. So that's a, a broader exegetical question that you might have in mind as we read through the thing. But I think you'll see that as we go through the, the notes of eschatological finality, the formula at the end of the days and all that kind of thing, uh, point so clearly to the end of history that uh, the, the answer, I think, is, is rather clear. Uh, other than that, by way of introduction, maybe let me just quickly uh, suggest an, an outline for Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, which is often thought to be rather clumsy uh, and the result of reworking and, and so on. I don't know that it's all that clumsy. It is somewhat uh, uh, complex. Uh, I would divide it into uh, uh, the three sections. The, the, the first basic section, 38, 1 through 13. Now, we've got to keep uh, two figures uh, uh, clear here in spite of the, uh, the similar sound of them. One is Gog and the other is God. R rather <laughs> different. <laughs> right. So the first thing is Gog's advent. I'm deliberately using 
sort of uh, messianic terminology, Advent, and, and, and that kind of thing, to, to bring out the fact uh, that, uh, you know, that Paul does the same thing when he's uh, describing Antichrist. He describes him in terms of messianic features, like a par- he, he has his Advent, he has his parousia. And my understanding of God, of course, is that he is Antichrist, so he has his Advent, he has his parousia, and uh, Antichrist's uh, parousia involves his gathering his uh, whole, uh, host together. And so uh, God's a- advent and gathering, huh? Is the theme here. And under that, I would have uh, points A and B. Uh, a is, uh, and we're r- reminded right from the outset that God, God is in control uh, of things. And so point A, it tells us how God brings Gog and, uh, to, to the battle. Mm-hmm. And uh, right away, we get the main point of Gog's identification, that he is Antichrist because he comes from Zaphon. So there, there is Gog up in, in his proper place, which is Zaphon, and God brings Gog from Zaphon, the phony Zaphon. It's, it's, we have another case of <coughs> pseudo-counterfeit things again. Zaphon is Armageddon, hmm? we'll be seeing. Zaphon is the mountain of God. It's the mountain of the gods. And uh, that, that's where God comes from. He comes from that place where he has uh, set himself forth on the mountain of the gods as God, the pseudo one, uh, the pagan Olympus one. Hmm? Whereas the true one, of course, is Zion. Zion is the true Armageddon where the Lord is. And what God does, then, and this is the heart of one's understanding of the whole thing. If you don't see this, you don't get the dimensions of the thing at all. What God does is to bring up Gog from the the phony Zion, the the phony Armageddon, up to Israel to confront the Lord himself there on Zion the true Zaphon, the true mountain of God. That's the basic theme of, of the whole thing. And uh, God orchestrates it. He, he brings him up, and uh, that's verses 1 through 6. And uh, then in the rest of it, verses 7 through 13, what follows, of course, is that having come up and, uh, and having uh, mustered his, uh, his uh, troops from all around the world, uh, God besieges uh, Zion. So um, he brings him up from from Zaphon versus uh, Zion, from the phony mountain of the gods to the true mountain of the true god. And that's the real story. It has nothing to do, you see, Armageddon with a battle, international battle of nations of, of the world, of the Russians against someone else, and all, all, all of this uh, completely off the wall business. Uh, this is the ultimate conflict of, of God and, and humanity and Satan and rebellion uh, against uh, God. It's Satan's uh, attempt to do again and uh, what he, to an extent, was successful in doing in the original battle of, God, uh, of uh, Armageddon and Eden uh, to. Uh, you usurp the the, the 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 place of the true glory. Well, 38, 14 through 23. Now is is God's response. That was God's advent. Now there's God's advent. So there was your pseudo creation again. Hmm? The the, the pseudo zaphon. Now you're getting your decreation, hmm? where God's advent is is one of. Of, of, of judgment. Now, in in the structure of the passage, what what you, you want to notice is the <clears throat> the way in, in which this basic section gets recapitulated by way of introduction to each new section along the way. And so, under this theme of, of God's advent, you have a recapitulating of the essential thought that you had here about how. God is against this figure of God whom he is bringing up from Zaphon. And by the way, each time this whole business is recapitulated, however condensed, whatever features are left out, that one isn't. The fact that the, the, the God comes from, the full expression is the Yark de Zaphon, the, the heights of Zaphon, the, that feature which identifies him as uh, the, the, the Antichrist type, 
And that's repeated each uh, time you get a recapitulation. Well, verses one and two, huh? Uh, no, let's see, no. Uh, verses 14 and, and, and 16 are uh, the recapitulation. And then you get the, uh, the, the full description of God's judgment. So here's the great white throne response uh, to the, the Antichrist. And that covers the rest of the thing, verses 17 through 23. With, a, with a, a breakdown, if I'll, I'll just read them off rapidly, uh, the three things are dealt with. Uh, uh, this judgment is uh, God's, uh, a fulfillment of God's prophetic word, verse 17. It uh, involves the destruction of God, verses 18 through, through 22. So it's a fulfillment of, of biblical prophecy. It takes the form of the destruction of, of God, that's the main point. And uh, the, the ultimate purpose of it is the, the, that God is glorified. Scripture is fulfilled. Gog is destroyed. God is glorified. Now then, that theme of God's judgment <clears throat> is, is the, the, the subject which is elaborated in chapter 39. <clears throat> so chapter 39 is the elaboration of the judgment theme that has been set forth here. Once again, this new major section begins with recapitulation. So uh, we're again told how God is against Gog, this fellow that he brings up from uh, Zav Zavkon, and uh, that's chapter 39, verses 1 and 2. <coughs> is the recapitulation. Then for the rest, chapter 39 consists actually of not just one, but two elaborations. We've had the theme of judgment, and now that theme is, uh, of judgment is elaborated twice, uh, and in a way in which certain motifs are in, in an interesting way repeated. The first, the first recap, or the first elaboration, is uh, verses three through eight. And under that, the two faint themes that we had, that Gog is destroyed, God is glorified, that, that just repeats. So the first point here is that Gog is destroyed. <clears throat> and two, God is glorified. And what we especially are interested in noting is the, the breakdown now, the elaboration of the theme of of, of, of judgment. This will be very useful then when we're trying to tie in Revelation 19 and 20 with this. We'll find features here that uh, show that especially that, that the Armageddon battle of Revelation 19, the Antichrist thing, finds its roots uh, here in, in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, Gog is uh, destroyed and that involves A, his weapons and the theme of death his army, all the fatalities lying on the battlefield. And then very striking, this is a very important one, is the theme of the banquet. When the battle's over and all of the, the casualties are there on the, on the field of battle, then the Lord invites the, the, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and everything to come to the banquet of the Lord, which he has provided for them. So you get the banquet theme. Very distinctive thing. And it's especially important because that, that theme of the banquet is a part of the story in Revelation 19 of God, Christ's judgment on Antichrist. Yeah? Uh, and uh, so that serves to tie these things together, showing Antichrist is God, God is Antichrist. And so this is one of the key things in that. And then uh, D, uh, the thought seems to be that uh, the judgment of God will even go back to the homeland uh, from whence uh, uh, the God has come from uh, this fire on Magog. Well, that, that then, uh, there's a second elaboration. There's a second elaboration uh, then that uh, chapter 39, verses 9 through 29. And with the same sequence of, of uh, details, uh, verses 9 and 10, the weapons, once again. 
verses 11 through 16 develops the thought of the battle casualty, <coughs> death with the thought of burial. So then death and burial match up. Then third is once again the banquet scene. This, this one is repeatedly again elaborated on even more. And then finally uh, an, another one on the broader judgment of, of, of the nations. And then point two, God is glorified. So you can see why some might say, oh, this is a clumsy, repetitive sort of structure, but I think it's effective that it serves to present certain themes and, and then to elaborate uh, uh, on them. Well, we didn't get reading very much here. If, uh, you have all kinds of time these days. I'm sure you could maybe be <laughs> taking a little look at Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew of Ezekiel 38 and, and uh, 39. Well, we'll be trying to show then that, that uh, here is this figure of God who, who comes from the territory which we would now call Turkey up, up there, but which is also sort of the area of Ararat. There seem to be connections with the flood episode and so on uh, that tie in, in here. Uh, and uh, Magog, uh, I, I think, is uh, is sort of, in a popular way, etymologized uh, to... Uh, into two parts with the M-A and, and, the, and the, the Gog. And I think that the name Gog huh, is uh, invented or derived from Magog by taking the M-A at the beginning, either as the Akkadian term, mat, which means land, or the, the Hebrew preformative M-A, which also means place or, or, or land, and uh, so Magog was etymologized by the author to mean the land or the place of Gog, which makes Gog then to be the one who is the Rosh, the Nasi, the, the chief prince, the, the, the head of, of that particular enterprise. And then the interesting thing will, will be, of course, to show how this Magog is also associated with the term the Yakte Zafon, the heights of Zafon, and uh, then to pursue the case that shows that the Arte is a phone, is the equivalent of the, the Har Moe, the Mount of Assembly, which is the equivalent of Armageddon, and uh, to, to make all the, the connections, which becomes, if you think it's been complex up to this point, <laughs> it then becomes even more intricate, but let's see if we can follow it. See you next Wednesday, Lord willing, huh? Not meet oh, yeah, Tuesday. Wednesday, we do not meet. Oh, yeah, you're right. Wednesday. We don't. Right. Tuesday's the last. <laughs> Isn't that right? I think we. I think the first day was for me on the 25th on Tuesday. Let's get it straight. Uh, is someone I mean, here? I have, here, Tuesday. here that's, I have Tuesday's the last one. Yeah, yeah that, uh, okay. two, next Tuesday's the last one. That was my understanding. Okay. So we have a few zillion years of history and eschatology to cover, but we'll do our best. Yes, please. I also want to be aware that, as I understand, I want to comment. Oh, wow, yeah, that, that is a right. Yeah. I mean, that's a, one should be flying side of there. That's my yeah, yeah, okay. That affects, I guess, more of the, the, the Friday classes I have in the afternoon. So. Yeah, now what, what will happen then on Tuesday? We meet at 11 o'clock, wasn't that it? Anyone? No, I, I think that this uh, uh, there's going to be a new convocation schedule that is plugged in, I think, uh, the, the following week or so something when there's some guest lecturer on campus, is that right? But I think this uh, coming Tuesday the, will be the old convocation schedule, whatever that is. But you'll have to check it. If, if, I, recall, if I recall the newsy tablet, the, the old convocation schedule is for Dr. Johnson this Friday. And then the new convocation schedule will go into effect next week. The I think you're right. That's right. So ours would be effective. It would be the new, which means we would start at, I think, 11.15, .15, I think, possibly. So check, check the things. That, and the net effect, I think, is probably shorter period, is it, than the usual? Okay. We'll give you more time. <laughs> Eleven twenty. Thank you. And how? When does it end? Whenever you want.
they both are presenting the theme of the Davidic Messianic King, the Shepherd of the Hill. The Covenant of Peace, I think, is an expression that occurs in both of them. I was expecting Phil to be here.